All right, welcome to the first of two joint classes between 341 and 433. Although even if it doesn't work out, we will still do one more. So there's several reasons for doing this. One is a lot of the material that the two classes are doing overlaps, so it makes logical sense to have them together. It fits very well in terms of where we are in the syllabus in both of the classes to have a lecture like this. We're going to get to see some of the material that both classes will be looking at later in the semester. And for 433, what's the other reason? <coughs> I'm sorry? I'm sorry? A baby. a baby is about to come. So I have been promised a photograph that I will then share with the class as soon as possible. Although sadly, I do not think the baby will come before the end of class. All right, the slides will be online. So if you go to my homepage, uh, public underscore HTML 341, you should be able to find it there. If not, shoot me an email. I'll send you the slides. I will send them to Professor Blackwood to distribute as well, but she may be a little bit busy over the next few days. Although I have a feeling she will be up, so she will probably have a chance and an eagerness to respond to email. All right, so what do I want to do today? I want to quickly review some probability. So I know in 433 you haven't done any formal probability yet, but a lot of the stuff is things you've already seen. For my students, some of it is stuff you've already seen. Some of it is a foreshadowing of what we're going to be doing later in the semester. So that as you get to the reading, you have a sense of why we care so much about all of this. Okay, uh, the next thing is I want to do is I want to introduce difference equations. So in 433, have you done any differential equations yet? Yes. yes. Have you done any difference equations? Difference equations are discrete versions of differential equations. They're where you basically move in fixed time steps, for instance. So in some sense, they're easier. In some sense, they're harder than continuous systems. What's the advantage of continuous systems? What tools do we have at our disposal? Calculus. Calculus. And so one of the great difficulties here is we don't have calculus at our disposal. But there's still a lot we can do with systems of difference equations, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, the next is just talking about how to solve them and how to solve them efficiently. A lot of times we can write down an answer, but if it takes us too long to get something meaningful from it, it does us no practical good. Other issues are numerical precision. So if you're doing some mathematical modeling, you are very concerned with how good of a job is your system doing in terms of error propagation, round off errors. This in fact was how a lot of fractal behavior was discovered, a lot of chaos theory was discovered in looking at simulations in the weather. Is somebody had done some numerical runs and then part of what he saw was interesting, he decided he wanted to look at it again the next day. And so he inputted the previous run, but he only inputted three digits accuracy, not six. And very quickly he got very different behavior. And in a deterministic process, you should be getting the same answer again and again and again. And he didn't think a small rounding error would make that much of a difference so quickly, but it actually did. And so when we do a lot of these calculations, it's fine to write down a mathematical formula to solve the problem, but we want to know, is that formula practical? And then the last is I want to give an, a fun application of difference equations and an application of probability. There's lots of different things to choose. I chose roulette. So I began 341 this year by talking about a friend of a former student of mine who did not hedge a bet and lost $300,000 that he could have easily won. So in terms of life lessons, if you are going to go to Vegas and play roulette, I want to at least give you some advice. The last is, uh, since I am teaching in an art building, this is the first and potentially last time I will be able to do this, my daughter and I wanted to prepare for the day, so she and I had a Lisa Simpson challenge. So my daughter and I both made pictures of Lisa Simpson. If you can try to figure out which one is mine and which one is my daughter's, I'm hoping it will be clear which one is which, but uh, sadly my wife did not think it was clear. Okay, and then for those of you who are sitting in that general area, if I start getting too out of focus in terms of the slides, I don't care if I can be seen, just let me know and give me some hand motions. Uh, it's annoying that this room does not have adequate blackboard space, so I've had to shift to uh, PowerPoint-like stuff for the day. Okay, so quick introduction back on probability. Whoa too fast. All right, let's go a little slower. So here is some nice function. It's non-negative and it integrates to 1. And whenever you have a non-negative function that integrates to 1, you can use this to define a probability distribution. You can talk about this as a probability density. And we'll say x is a random variable with density p of x, where that's my plot up above, if the following is true. So p of x is greater than or equal to 0. The integral from minus infinity to infinity equals 1. And then the probability I take on a value between a and b is just the area under the curve. So I know a lot of you have had me in calculus classes before. One of the big things I love to hop on is why do we spend so much time finding areas under curves? Only once in my life, I was in California, 
has someone on the street just come up to me and ask for the yo-yo under a curve? I'm in my 40s. That's not a really good uh, track record. Why do we spend so much time in calculus calculating these areas? Because these areas are useful. What are they useful for? They're useful for finding probabilities of events. So if I want to find the probability that I'm between 0.2 and 0.6, all I have to do is calculate the area under the curve. All right, some specific quantities that we might be interested in is the mean value for the system. It's the average value, so we integrate x times p of x. And the variance is we look at how spread things out are. We integrate x minus the mean squared p of x. So the closer the probability is to the mean, the tighter it's set up, the smaller the variance is going to be. The more spread out the probability is, the larger the variance is going to be. Anybody who's ever taken a pre-med class will know all about means and variances in terms of grading distributions. Right? Uh, I was visiting a friend at Harvard several years ago, and not only did they give means and variances for the pre-med classes, they gave the third and the fourth moments. So the highly competitive Harvard students would know exactly where they stood relative to their peers. For most purposes, the mean and the variance is what we really need. You know, the mean is the average value, the variance is how spread out is it. And then the last concept we need is independence. Knowledge of one random variable gives no information about knowledge of another. So a lot of things are independent of each other. A lot of things are dependent. Can anybody give me an example of two events that are independent? Two events that are independent. Yes? Two dice rolls being one. Two dice rolls being one. So typically, if, if the die are fair, the outcome of one die should not affect the outcome of the other. Okay, somebody give me an example of two events that are dependent. I'm sorry? Looking at a deck, taking one card after the other, once you see what that first card is, that will affect the probabilities of the second. If your first card is a king of spades, very unlikely the next card will be the king of spades. If it is, I would be very careful <coughs> playing with that person. Uh, anybody ever play the game BS? When I played in college, we actually had variable numbers of cards. We would mix a couple of decks, so you wouldn't know ahead of time how many aces, kings, queens, etc. were in the game. And it made it a lot more interesting. All right. One of the most important distributions you will find in probabilities, the normal distribution, the bell curve, the Gaussian, the more names something has, the more important it probably is. All right. This is you know, a nice distribution. And one of the big results in the subject is if you have a bunch of independent, identically distributed random variables, that means they all take on the same shape for their probabilities. You can look at the sum of them. Well, one of the big things we do is we standardize things. If I look at the sum, well, if each one of them has mean mu, then as I take more and more terms, I expect the sum to be getting larger and larger and larger. I expect its size to be roughly n times the mean or n times mu. So what we do is we subtract off the expected value, and then we divide by the standard deviation and the square root of n. I'm not going to go in now why you would do that, but this gives me a standardized variable that now has mean 0 and variance 1. The whole idea is I want to compare apples and apples. And so if I don't standardize things, just because I'm taking more and more terms as n gets to infinity, it's going to just have a naturally growing standard deviation. This compresses it so it now has a standard deviation of 1. And the big result in probability is that as long as x is nice, this quantity will converge to being normally distributed. So just to see this in action, I chose a uniform distribution. So the probability is the same between, say, minus alpha and alpha, and 0 everywhere else. And then I've just adjusted things so that they have the same scale. And so does that look like a bell curve, yes or no? No. It's not horrible, but it does not look like a bell curve. Let's add two uniform distributions. So if you want to think, we've already gotten the example of rolling a die. If I roll the die once, what are the possible outcomes in rolling a die? What can I get if I roll a die? One through six, and they're all equally likely. If I roll two die, what are my outcomes? Two through 12, the most common is a seven, which I can get six different ways. So six out of 36, or one sixth of the time I get a seven, trailing all the way down to just one out of 36 of the times I get a two, one out of 36 of the times I get a 12. What do you expect the shape of the sum of two uniform random variables to look like? The sum of two dies. If it was just one, it's a square. What do you think it would be for two? I'm sorry? OK, so one is an Aztec pyramid. Sure. And I'm going to smooth that out, and I'm going to do it because we're, now, we're not doing a die. We're doing uniform, but yes. So 
it'll become a triangle. And so you know, no, if you're doing the discrete thing, you can easily make it into an Aztec pyramid, and that sounds much better. So I will try to remember to change that in the book. Does that look like a bell curve? It's close. That's not that bad. I mean, for just two sums? How about four sums? Eight sums. The convergence is very fast. So this is a great thing when we're doing a lot of modeling. You don't want to work with very complicated distributions. It's nice if you can reduce the analysis to just one or two well-understood quantities. And what we're seeing here is with just eight terms, we have a really good approximation with a bell curve. Now, the bell curve actually has a probability going all the way off to infinity. We're not going to get that with sums of a fixed number of sums of uniform random variables, but it does a pretty good approximation. OK. If you were curious, this is the actual density for the sum of four uniform uh, random variables. Uh, it took Mathematica a while to just chug through all of this. I think it would have been faster for me to do the calculation by hand, but I can have Mathematica running this in the background. All right. You can write this down explicitly, and if you want to, you can work with this explicitly. Or you can use results from calculus and say, well, let's approximate this with the normal distribution, which is a lot easier to work with. So that's one of the themes I want you to get out of this, is that our goal is to replace very complicated functions with simpler ones that are easier to work with. All right. Introduction to difference equations. I'm hoping everybody has at least seen some difference equations. So they're a discrete version of differential equations. The general form is I have some sequence a0, a1, a2, a3, a4, and the nth term is some function of the previous. Depending on how general you want to get, you can easily set up a most general formulation that you have no hope of solving, where you maybe change the function at each stage, you change how many terms deep you go, Let's assume right now I have one fixed function that describes how I evolve, and I only have to look at the previous L states. There are a lot of things in life that are like this, where all that matters is what's been going on recently, the recent history. Uh, sometimes people do you know, stock market analysis like this, where only a couple of previous cycles really matter. In my probability class, we did a game of hoops. First one to make a basket wins. Well, once two people miss, the game has reset. It doesn't really matter what's gone on. There's a lot of things in life where you only need to look back a finite amount of time. So hopefully you've seen the Fibonacci's. Fn is Fn minus 1 plus Fn minus 2. So if I want to know any term in the sequence, I just add the two terms before. It turns out a generalization of this would be very useful when we get to roulette. Usually you define the Fibonacci numbers to start the sequence either 0, 1, or 1, 2. And depending on what problems you're looking at, there are benefits and disadvantages to each approach. And as time permits, I'll talk a little bit about them. All right, so for the most part, we're going to look at constant coefficient fixed depth. So what this means is my function f is extremely nice. <coughs> it just says, take the numbers a and 1 through a and minus l, multiply each one of them by a fixed constant, and then add. So the Fibonacci's would be the special case when l equals 2, c1 equals c2 equals 0. Is it difficult to find Fibonacci numbers? If I go 1, 2, 3, 5, can you give me the next one? 8, can you give me the next one? All right, let's go forward. Can you give me the 2 millionth Fibonacci number? Eventually. If your grade, um, I can't speak for, I can speak for myself. I choose not to. I'll speak with Professor Blackwood. If you do it by pen and paper, she will give you an A for the class if you calculate the trillionth Fibonacci number by hand. <laughs> do you want to take this trade? No. no, right? The amount of time it would take the size of that number to do by hand going through this algorithm is very, very bad, right? I'm going to show you a way to actually bypass this algorithm and quickly write down the answer. All right, so as I said, you can compute this, but it is expensive. All right, everybody has taken linear algebra, and I'm going to assume incorrectly that everybody remembers everything from linear algebra, but I will still just quickly review a few things, so I do apologize if this is a boring review. I'm going to write the Fibonacci numbers in matrix form. OK, so I'm going to write them as a vector and a matrix. So fn plus 1 fn is my vector. And if I take the matrix 1, 1, 1, 0, and I apply it to fn, fn minus 1, if you do the matrix multiplication, the, the top becomes fn plus fn minus 1. Well, by the definition of the Fibonacci's, that's fn plus 1. The bottom just becomes fn. We can use linear algebra to attack the Fibonacci numbers. And in fact, we can do this for more than just the Fibonacci numbers. We can do this for any fixed depth, uh, constant coefficient li uh, li linear recurrence. So it's amazing what we can do with this knowledge. 
So it leads to a matrix formulation. So in general, Vn plus 1 is some matrix applied to Vn. Well, now we just lather, rinse, repeat. What is Vn? Vn is A times Vn minus 1. So we have A of A of Vn minus 1. So we get A squared Vn minus 1. And we keep going all the way down until we get to a to the n times v1. Or if we want to, we could go to a to the n plus 1 times v0, depending on how far down we want to go. What this means is if we want to understand where we are at time n plus 1, all we have to do is know our initial conditions and then apply a very large matrix to it. So then the question becomes, how do you compute large powers of a matrix? So what did you learn in linear algebra to do something like this? Spectral theorem, you want to diagonalize the matrix. And if you can diagonalize the matrix, you can do the calculations very quickly. So now, if the matrix is diagonalizable with eigenvalues lambda i and eigenvectors ui, we have the following general form. Vn plus 1 is going to be equal to the following. We have an explicit closed form solution. So if you want the trillionth Fibonacci number, you don't have to go through all the intermediate steps. You can just jump to the end. So for the Fibonacci numbers, we get what's called Binet's formula. A generalization of this holds in greater uh, recurrences. This is one of my favorite formulas in mathematics. So I know a lot of you have heard me talk about this. Why do I love this formula? I'm sorry? It has irrational numbers, it has divisions, but at the end of the day, it's an integer. You know, if we start the Fibonacci numbers with you know, 0, 1, these numbers are all going to be integers. Everything balances. If you want, as a fun exercise, try replacing the square root of fives and twos with different numbers and see what choices can you put in there and still guarantee that you'll get an integer at the end of the day. All right, so this is a closed form expression for the Fibonaccis. You want the trillionth Fibonacci number, it's not so bad. Now you still have to evaluate, um, oh, I dropped the ends, oh well. Um, yeah, the, the, the ends are missing. This should be to the nth and this should be to the end. Um, yes, otherwise all the Fibonacci numbers are constant which would be uh, very interesting. All right. Uh, OK, so what I want to do now is I want to imagine a population of wheels with the following assumptions. This is not a reasonable set of assumptions, but um, it's somewhat inspired, I think, by Star Trek for The Voyage Home, which had so many unreasonable assumptions already. I feel I am justified in making a few more of my own. All right, for extra credit, what were the names of the wheels in Star Trek for The Voyage Home? OK. So I'm going to assume every wheel dies when the wheel turns four. No wheels die before four years of age. Every wheel lives until a plump old age of four and then immediately dies. OK? I'm also going to imagine wheels are completely paired for life. All right, so wheels are always in a male and female pair in terms of giving birth. Each pair becomes pregnant when they turn one and gives birth to two pairs when turn two. Each pair becomes pregnant when they turn two and gives birth to one pair when they turn three. Okay? I am not even trying to make this reasonable. We'll do that later. This is the walk before you can run model. Let's try to figure out how we would solve something like this. Let's see what the mathematics we'll get from something like this. And then we'll go to the more general case. If I tell you how many wheels there are initially that are 0, 1, 2, and 3, and 4 years old, do you think you will be able to predict for me how many wheels there will be of each age going forward in time? Why? Because they give birth at very precise times. They give birth at very precise times. They die at very precise times. This is completely deterministic. There's no randomness here. It is a completely determined system. You give me the initial conditions, and we know exactly how everything will evolve. Is this reasonable? No. But you know, it's a good start. All right, so we can figure out, yes, because it is deterministic. All right, so let's set it up as a system of difference equations, because this is electron difference equations, and that's what we're doing. A n will be the number of pairs born in year 1, I'm sorry, in year n. B n will be the number of pairs of 1-year-olds in year n. C n, the number of pairs of 2-year-olds in year n. And D n will be the number of pairs of 3-year-olds in year n. Why don't I have number of pairs of 4-year-olds or 5-year-olds? They're dead. I don't care about them. All right. Once you die, I don't care. Okay? I've got too much to do. I, I, I have no time for dead wheels. Okay? I've got enough focus with the stuff that I like. Can anybody tell me how these numbers change in time? Can anybody give me a relation between any of the numbers and any other numbers? 
So if I want to find out how many wheels are there who are three year old in year n plus one, how would I get that? How do you become a three year old wheel in year n plus one? You were a two year old in year n. No wheels die until they turn four. So we can have a really nice system of equations. If I want to find out how many three year old wheels, and I apologize for the people at home because the red lights can't be seen, I guess can't even be seen here. Um, dn plus 1 is just cn. All the wheels that were 2 year old get 1 year older. Similarly, cn plus 1 is just bn, bn plus 1 is just an. The harder one is an plus 1, it's 2bn plus 1cn. So I have a system of equations. One of the things I'm really big on is trying to write the algebra in a meaningful, clear way. And I think even though it doesn't make much of a difference, I think it's nice to write it like this. And now I've got my a n column, my b n column, my c n column, my d n column. Hopefully this is making it clear that there's a matrix looking beneath. Yes? Is the a n plus 1 just coming from the, the, the book? Yes. <coughs> Isn't it every pair then? And every pair gives birth to two wheels. Right. You always talk about giving birth to a pair. So the, the ones who are BN plus 1, they, they came from the ANs the year before. They got one year older. Anybody who? Oh, is it, is it the pair, though? Shouldn't um, and like the pair giving birth to two when they're that old, shouldn't it just be that amount? And for CN, it should be half of that amount? That no, I, I, I don't want to deal with you know, halves and whatnot. So I'm saying each pair gives birth. When you're one year old, you get pregnant, and then you give birth to two pairs, not two wheels. Oh, two pairs. Two oh. pairs, yes. And then when you're two years old, you get pregnant. And when you turn three, you give birth to one pair. This was easier than just assuming a society of, uh, anyways. So ju just in terms of just what's going on, we get to a matrix like this. OK? So I can write this in matrix form. Here is the matrix. And so we call matrices of this form Leslie matrices. And so there's a lot of stuff that's known about them. Uh, there's very special systems. OK. So what properties does A have? Is this form of the matrix reasonable? Does anything strike your fancy when you look at this matrix? Anything <laughs> seem strange about this matrix? Anything jumping out at you? Yes? It's not full length. There's an entire column of zeros. Is it reasonable that there's an entire column of zeros, or did I make a mistake? Year four wheels don't exist. And once you turn three, you're not reproducing any more wheels. You basically left. You know, you're out vacationing in Florida or whatever. You have no involvement anymore in what's going on. So there's a lot of you know, biological systems where uh, the parents lay eggs, and then they leave, and they never interact with their hatchlings. And so from an evolutionary perspective, once they leave, they no longer have any role in what's going on with the development of their children. So over here, we're actually seeing something like that in the final column being all zeros. So I like to use Mathematica. That was the first one that I really learned how to use. You can use any system you want. You just set it up as a matrix. So for matrix, you start off with a curly brace. You end with a curly brace. And then you input the rows between braces. So now I have my matrix A is a 4 by 4 matrix. I can calculate the eigenvalues. I can calculate the eigenvectors. So you can calculate all these things very simply. If I put in the initial conditions, I could even solve, and I could you know, do the spectral decomposition very quickly. All right. So what are some problems with this model? So anybody want to tell me something wrong with this model? This could be the easiest question you get all year. Yes? That isn't how well reproduce. Be more specific. There's some randomness. There's some randomness. You know, not every wheel is going to be giving birth, every pair of wheels to you know, two pairs in their first year and one pair in the second. There could be time differences. There could be number differences. You could have some old wheels actually giving birth again. Anything else that's really unreasonable? Not all the wheels will survive to age four. Some wheels might die earlier. Some might live longer. Right. So some wheels could live longer. Is there a number of wheels that approach infinity, probably, depending on the starting conditions? 
Um, so that's an interesting question over here. Uh, this system will actually go off, and they will, we're assuming they have unlimited resources. So this is where, uh, has anybody here seen Star Trek IV? <laughs> All right, one person has seen it, two people, okay. So I apologize for giving away some of the plot, but basically an alien probe has visited the Earth millions of years ago. It comes back, and it's very pissed that all the whales have been killed because it liked the whales, and it's destroying the Earth. So we have to go back in time and bring back two humpback whales to repopulate the species. So in this, <laughs> if you think this is bad, watch Star Trek V. Okay, it gets worse. Okay, so in terms of unreasonable assumptions, we will assume that they have unlimited resources because Starfleet knows that if these whales do not keep reproducing, the probe will be back. But in the real world, you would want to take into account finite resources. There's several ways to do this. One is you could put in predators. One you could say is if we have too many whales, they're competing for the same resources. This is meant to be a baby toy problem to give you a sense of what's out there. And then what you want to do is you want to keep adding these different layers. So the fact that there's finite resources, this is a great one. All right, so I didn't list that one. I'll try to fix the slides. What is the solution? One of the solutions, not surprisingly, is probability. You know, there's a reason this is a joint lecture. What we can do is we can put in random variables for the entries. Instead of saying you give birth to exactly two pairs, well, let's do some random number. I'm still assuming a discreteness, that all the wheels are in phase. They all give birth at the same time. They all die at the same time and, you know, in terms of the year. You can tweak that. It makes the things a little bit more complicated. What you might want to do is you might want to divide the year into maybe four sub-years. And in fact, if that's not enough, maybe 12 sub-years. We call these months. Yeah. I, uh, those are Aztec weeks. And Aztec week is actually the equivalent to a regular month. So if you think months is too big of a time period, what would you do? Days. And if days is too big of a time period, and at this point, what are we damn close to? Oh, I'll have to edit that out later. So what are we close to? Continuous, right? So if you just make the system discrete enough, it's essentially continuous. And then you can try to approximate this with continuous techniques. So right now, I'll assume that I'm going to draw my matrix elements. So in this model, there is a finite chance that the old real couple will actually give birth and have a pleasant or unpleasant surprise. All right. Typical notation, we typically use capital letters to denote random variables, lowercase for the values. So we'll use capital R for the birth rates, a time n, we'll use capital S for the survival rates. And now we have a product of matrices. This is now a very interesting subject. How do you deal with a product of random matrices? We talked earlier today with the central limit theorem, which deals with sums. So if you've taken a class with me, what do you want to do right now? You want to take logs, but you've got logs of matrices. Matrices don't commute. This could be a very complicated issue. The question is, is there some type of central limit theorem for products of matrices? And this is something that we really want if we are going to be doing a lot of mathematical modeling, is we have some system, and we can't take fixed entries. That's not reasonable. But we can draw the entries from a probability distribution, and this should give a really good model of what's happening. Okay. So let me give you a little bit of review on products of matrices from linear algebra. So in general, matrix multiplication is difficult. You've got to be careful. Order matters. There's something called the commutator of A and B, which is AB minus BA. And in an ideal world, the commutator of every matrix would be zero. That would mean all matrices would commute. We are far from an ideal world. And in general, two matrices don't commute. The commutator measures a little bit of how much they don't commute. There's also something called the matrix exponential. So you've seen e to the x. This is now e to the matrix. And it's defined as the sum of 1 over k factorial a to the k, so long as a is the square matrix. What's nice about this is it doesn't matter what matrix you put in. The matrix exponential always converges, just like the exponential function always converges. So it's a nice exercise to prove this. Uh, so I'll put up some links to something like this. Now the questions might become, how do you compute this efficiently? And so I'll put up some links on that a little bit. So let's consider two square matrices, A and B. Then e to the A plus B is e to the A times e to the B. <coughs> yes or no? Because matrix multiplication is commutative, right? Unfortunately, no. e to the A plus B means going back over here and replacing A with A plus B and expanding. You want to use the binomial theorem. When you use the binomial theorem, the order in which you multiply now matters. A, B, A is not the same as A, A, B. So unfortunately, e to the A plus B is not e to the A, e to the B. 
you've got an e to the negative commutative a or b over 2. And actually, you have th this next term. And you actually have infinitely many terms involving more and more nightmares of the commutators. You can begin to appreciate now why we like to restrict to certain classes of matrices in linear algebra. We would love to have matrices that commute with each other. We can then start to use the matrix exponential. And when you're doing some mathematical modeling, you might see the matrix exponential coming up in solving some of these systems of difference equations or differential equations. So I've got you know, some notes if you're interested, if you want to learn a little bit more about stuff like this. Other issues is being able to multiply a to the n quickly or being able to multiply a times b quickly. And there are some very powerful techniques for stuff like that. <coughs> All right, so efficient computations. So we've talked a little bit about this. So what I want to do is I want to come up with another way to find Binet's formula. We use the linear algebra perspective, you know, the spectral theorem approach. I want to try to do it without doing that, because I know a lot of people are a little hazy on their linear algebra. I'm going to use one of my favorite methods, the method of divine inspiration. So the way the method of divine inspiration works is you basically just, you know, Go like this for a little bit, and then you write down the answer. Sometimes you go this way, sometimes you walk, you know, something like that. What is the problem with the method of divine inspiration? It's somewhat inconsistent, it's somewhat inconsistent for most of us. Most of us are not always divinely inspired. If so, I probably would have remembered to put in those ends earlier. Okay? But a lot of times, Divine inspiration does work. Just writing down an answer and then just checking and seeing, does your guess work? Maybe fixing it a little bit. You might have seen this in some calculus problems. If you're trying to find what function has derivative log of x, you might try, well, let me try the function maybe like x log of x. Because when I take the derivative of the product rule, the derivative of x is 1. I get log x, ah, but I have this crappy extra piece of plus 1. I can subtract off maybe x. The derivative of x is negative 1. That will cancel. I'll go with x log x minus x. The idea is you start with something nice play with it, and then try to fix it. So what I want to do is I want to try to show you how you can get to some answers with you know, not too much work, what answers might be reasonable, why, when we did that linear algebra, why do we get that answer in the end? Where is that coming from? And how you can use this to attack other problems. So let's go back to the Fibonaccis. So Fn is Fn minus 1 plus Fn minus 2. Well, if I want to get a feel of what's going on, I notice that fn is going to be greater than or equal to 2 fn minus 2, because my Fibonacci numbers are increasing, and it's going to be less than or equal to 2 fn minus 1. All I'm doing is on the right-hand side, I'm either replacing the larger one with the smaller one or the smaller one with the larger one. So I have this sandwiched relationship. Well, what I can do is I can now look at these two different recurrences. Let's look at fn equals 2 fn minus 1. This is a really nice recurrence. If fn equals 2 fn minus 1, then I double every single time. If I have fn is equal to 2 fn minus 2, then I double every two iterations. That means each, each iteration I increase by. So two iterations I increase by 2. One iteration, what do I increase by? Two. Square root of 2. Excellent. And so I get square root of 2 to the n is less than equal to fn is less than equal to 2 to the n. This suggests that the Fibonacci numbers are growing exponentially. It suggests that we should try fn equals r to the n. So this is how you can try to be divinely inspired. Take a complicated system, try looking at simpler cases, build your intuition there, and then once you have that intuition, then attack the problem you care about. So let's try fn equals r to the n. All right. And then if we do that, we will get Binet's formula. I'm not going to go through all the algebra there. I'm going to show you a third way to get this. I'm going to show you the generating function approach. This is going to be extremely important in probability later in the semester. This is a way to just get this on your radar screen now. Uh, for those of you, how many of you have taken a class in differential equations? All right, excellent. You should be thinking about series expansions. Uh, if you thought divine inspiration was bad, wait till you see generating functions. So we start off with a recurrence relation. I'm going to write it as fn plus 1 is fn plus fn minus 1, just to mix things up and make sure you're still paying attention. And I'm going to construct the generating function g of x. It will be the sum of fn <coughs> times x to the n. So what I'm doing is I'm building a function whose coefficients are the Fibonacci numbers. What is the problem with this? Uh, no, we know the Fibonacci numbers are not going faster than 2 to the n. So if I take x to be less than 1 half, this will actually converge. So you should always be thinking about convergence, you know, especially when we leave the math department. What, what might be a problem with this? 
So I want to form this function by using the Fibonacci numbers. Do we know all the Fibonacci numbers? No, the whole point is we're trying to figure out what the Fibonacci numbers are. So how do we build a function using the Fibonacci numbers when we don't know what the Fibonacci numbers are? But in a sense, we do know the Fibonacci numbers. Why? Well, we have the recurrence relation. Once you have the recurrence relation, you know everything about the Fibonacci's. It's already there. We just have to extract it. So the question is, how can we extract this? Well, let's put in fn plus 1. I'm going to just shift indices a little bit. And so if you've taken differential equations, this should remind you of those series solution games you play. So fn plus 1 is fn plus fn minus 1. I just plug this in here. Notice this is looking a lot like g of x. The only thing that's off is my indices don't quite match. I have fn x to the n plus 1. I want fn x to the n. What should I do to that term? What should I do to the fn x to the n plus 1? Yes. Take out an x. What should I do for the next one? Same thing. Do it twice. Take out two x's. So if I do that, do a little bit of algebra, I take out the x, I take out the x squared, and now I almost have g of x. I don't quite have g of x because g of x is supposed to start at n equals 1. That starts at n equals 3. That starts at n equals 2. What can I do? It's not quite g of x. It's close. What can I do to get it to be g of x? So I add the terms I'm missing. Can you just add the terms you're missing to one side? No, so if you add the terms to one side, you subtract them from the other. So what I can do is I can just put in whatever terms I'm missing, and then I can get all three of those expressions to be g of x. And so I get g of x minus f1 of x minus f2 of x squared is x g of x minus f1 of x plus x squared times g of x. And now we can just solve for g of x, and we get g of x is x over 1 minus x minus x squared. All right, so now we have an explicit formula for g. This is a miracle. We start off with the Fibonacci numbers, we form a function, and at the end of the day, we have a nice closed form expression. The difficulty is, can we do anything useful with it? And the answer is surprisingly yes. We're going to use one of the most hated techniques from Calc 2. When you do integration in Calc 2, what technique do you hate more than all others? If you said u substitution, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. No, u substitution is nice. I'm sorry? No, parts is nice. <laughs> Partial fractions, right? Partial fractions is almost universally voted uh, the least favorite of all techniques. The only people who don't vote for it are the people who have blocked it out of their mind. All right? Partial fractions. But that's what's actually going to save the day here in attacking problems like this. We expand the denominator, and then we just use the geometric series expansion, and we get Binet's formula. And this time I do remember the ends at least. Right. So what I want you to get a sense from this is that there are great ways to attack problems like this. You can take the things you don't know and you can bundle them together. You take local data and you make this global object. And then somehow you can get information about the local data from the global. We will be doing this all the time. These are going to be extremely useful. Uh, so we bundle information. We can deduce numerous properties. So here's one of my favorite examples. If I look at the sum of the Fibonacci numbers divided by 3 to the n, it turns out this is just over 3 over 5, 3 fifths. And here is some simple mathematical code. The first one is the infinite sum, and the second is just taking the generating function and replacing x with 1 third. And so the generating function is enormously powerful in terms of what it allows you to do. OK, uh, so what I want to do now is I want to go to roulette. Uh, what I'm doing here is a very slightly expanded version of a video I made with OIT several years ago, which is available online. How many of you have ever seen roulette before? All right, so this is what a roulette board looks like. We're going to modify it a little bit. In general, you can bet on lots of different things. We will assume for simplicity you can only bet on red or not red. All right, in the actual world, there's other bets you can do. We will skip them. In the actual world, Vegas has two greens, 0 and double zero, so the probability of a red is not quite one half. I'm feeling very generous today. I will ignore the greens, and I will assume that peak was 1 half, so that on every bet, you have a 50-50 chance of winning. This is better odds than you will get in Vegas. Okay? It's the Williams advantage. All right. Here is the strategy double plus 1. This is one of the most favorite strategies people have in going to Vegas. They are convinced it will net them millions of dollars. You bet $1 on red. If it wins, you're up a dollar. If not, you're down by a dollar. 
bet two dollars on red if you've lost. Well, if I lost a dollar and I bet two dollars, if I win, I've now netted a dollar. But if not, I'm down three dollars. How much should I bet? Four. If it wins, I net one dollar. If it loses, I'm now down seven. How much should I bet? This is why it's called double plus one. Every time you double your bet, eventually the red comes up and you win a dollar. And then just lather, rinse, repeat. Just keep doing this until you've made enough money. Now, there are obviously some issues with this or I would be in Vegas here. And it's not just because Professor Blackwood needs me to cover her class. There's a reason I'm not in Vegas. Okay. So the question is, what is wrong with this strategy? A lot of people have gotten bankrupt doing this. As an aside, Vegas is wonderful at understanding human psychology. And what they now do is they actually display the results of the last few roulette spins. Uh, I've probably given this speech to several of you before. Vegas doesn't care what kind of moron you are, so long as you are the type of moron who will bet money. There are people who say, oh, red has come up five times in a row. Red is lucky. I better bet on red. Or oh, red has come up five times in a row. Black is due. I'll bet on black. They don't really care as long as people keep placing money. And as long as people keep placing money, Vegas will win. This is one of the best strategies I know. Can anybody tell me an issue with this strategy? Yes. Have you been looking at my bank account? No. Okay, yes. I sadly do not have an infinite amount of money to bet. So, whoops. And so, for instance, uh, here is a compilation. Eventually, I need to bet one million plus change. Yes. Well, but if I win, that's fine. I net a and then I just lather, rinse, repeat. I just, I just reset. So if I, if I lose, I just go back. So I do the whole process, and I make a dollar. I do the whole process again, I make another dollar. And if a dollar is not enough, I just bet a, I do it. Instead of betting a dollar, I bet $100. I put in a couple of zeros. I, 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 I want to make sure we still talk about bankroll before we go on to other issues. So if you have, an, if you have a question about bankroll, that's fine. OK. Anybody take an econ class? I'm trying to work on a project with some professors in economics, so I feel that it is now acceptable for me to make unreasonable assumptions. So I am going to make the eccentric rich aunt-uncle hypothesis. So I assume the existence of an eccentric family member who has an unlimited bankroll, who will always provide me with whatever funds I need to place a bet, but will not actually give me a dollar directly. So I can now cover any wager I need to make. Okay? So I will not have to worry about running out of money to place the bet. I will not have to worry about nerves of steel of putting down $1 trillion on a spin. I claim even under the assumption of the eccentric rich aunt uncle hypothesis, I'm still in trouble. Anybody know what the other issue is? The tables have max and minimums. So for instance, uh, this table limit. So maybe the table limit is $200. And the next bet I'm supposed to place is $256. The table will not let me bet more than 200 the table limit is calculated very carefully. They have mathematicians working on this. And they calculate what is the probability of getting a certain number of blacks in a row so that you go bust? What is the probability of losing a certain number of spins in a row? What do you think is going to model this? Based on what this lecture is about. What, difference equations. A generalization of the Fibonacci numbers will tell you why this strategy is bad. And it will even tell you where you might want to put that, that limit. All right, so let's try to calculate the probability uh, that we get five blacks in a row. We'll say that if we lose five spins in a row, we go bankrupt. And I'm going to let Pn be the probability we will not get five consecutive blacks in n spins, and Qn will be the probability we will get five consecutive blacks in n spins. So not surprisingly, these two numbers sum to one. This is a major advance in probability that frequently one event is easier to calculate than the other, but since they're related by this very nice simple formula, if you can do one, you can do the other. Anybody have any thoughts as to is it easy to calculate the probability we do get five consecutive blacks or we don't? Got a 50-50 chance. Better odds than Vegas. So you think it's, it's a better chance that we get five? When you don't have much experience, it's hard to guess. You know, when you haven't really worked too much in difference equations. Working in difference equations, I know that it's much easier to calculate the probability we don't get five consecutive blacks. And we'll see why in a moment. 
All right, so let's imagine you know, we start off with Pn. Pn is the probability we do not get five consecutive blacks in n spins. I have two possibilities. I spin a black or I spin a red. And we will assume each happens with probability one half. In general, you can do probability p and one minus p. Given now that I'm over here, given that my first spin was a red, how many more spins do I have to do? Not five. I'm trying to calculate the probability I don't have five consecutive blacks and n spins. I've had one spin. How many spins are left? n minus one. For those of you in my probability class, the press you know, with the number of spins you have to take in the beginning. We have n minus one more spins to take. Our first spin was red. What is the probability we do not get five consecutive blacks in the remaining n minus one spins? This is the hottest part of the problem. I'm sorry? Pn minus 1, excellent. Why is it Pn minus 1? We're back to the start. It doesn't matter. That red cannot start a string of five consecutive blacks. What about this black? Can that start a string of five consecutive blacks? Absolutely. So we've got to analyze that side of the tree more carefully. All right, so this is Pn minus 1, and now we go over here. Now we have two possibilities, 1 half and 1 half. What's the probability if we end up here, that's going to be 1 fourth. We spun a black, then we spun a red. What's the probability that in the remaining n minus 2 spins, we don't get five consecutive blacks? P n minus 2. Because now we have n minus 2 spins to go with, and the first two, black, red, can't start a string of five consecutive blacks. And we can continue going all the way down. Now let's look at five spins. Uh, it's beginning to get tough to fit all of this on the screen. So you know, to get to the sixth one, I'm going to have to start shrinking things. Do I have to go to the next level? Good, because I'm running out of time. Why don't I have to go to the next level? I have five consecutive blacks. What is the probability I don't get five consecutive blacks in a row, given that my first five spins are black? Zero. Right? We've started off with five consecutive blacks. The probability we don't get five consecutive blacks is now zero. So in this case, that's why it's easy to calculate Pn rather than Qn. In Qn's case, this would actually be a 1, because we now have five consecutive blacks. We now have a recurrence relation. Pn is half the time we get to, we start off with a red, and we get Pn minus 1. A fourth of the time, we go black, red, and we have Pn minus 2, and so on. Uh, one thirty-second of the time, we get Pn minus 5. This is almost the same as the Fibonacci's. The only thing that changes is we now have one halves, and now it's depth five. This means we can't use the quadratic formula. The math is a little bit more involved, but fundamentally it's the same. The mathematics behind the Fibonacci numbers tells you why this is a very bad idea. So we also need initial conditions. So I need some initial conditions. Fortunately, these are the easiest initial conditions you can think of. If you just say them out loud, you will find them. What is the probability I do not get five consecutive blacks in zero spins? OK. Can you give me any other places where I have a nice, easily computable quantity? I know I don't have five consecutive blacks in zero spins. What else? Yep. Yeah. I don't have five spins. If I don't have five spins, I can't have five consecutive blacks. So the initial conditions are just one, 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 one. And now we feed that into this recursion formula, and you can calculate everything. Or we can use generalizations. We can use the linear algebra approach. We can use the method of divine inspiration. We can use the generating function. We can use all of those to write down a closed form solution. Now, the problem is this is a quintic. It, in general, anybody here in abstract algebra? OK, I've never taken abstract algebra either. It somehow slips my. In abstract algebra, one of the things you eventually learn is you know, which things can you solve or not solve, or sometimes they do in Galois theory. We don't have a general solution for a quintic or higher in terms of the coefficients, but we can numerically approximate the roots. And that's what I told Mathematica to do. You may notice I'm using the letter A rather than P. Mathematica didn't want me to use the letter P. It kept crashing. When I changed all the P's to A's, it worked. As a theoretician, this bothers me. As somebody who is preparing a lecture, it doesn't really bother me. I don't mind doing a search and replace. It's strange how finicky these systems are. But if you do one point over two for one of the coefficients, this converts it from being an exact rational number to an approximated real number, and Mathematica now numerically approximates. 
And so it solves the recurrence relation, and it gives you a n as the following expression. Now over here, when you have 1 point plus 0 point i, you should realize that that's just maybe a 1. Um, over here, we have 0.982974 to the n. So lots of you know, interesting things to look at. So what I've done here is I've plotted the recurrence relation as to what happens. So here's a little bit of a code to just you know, go through and numerically compute things. Here is the probability of having five consecutive blacks in 100 spins, it's 81%. In 200 spins, 96.59%. So if you do 200 spins, you have almost 100% chance of getting five consecutive blacks. Even at 100 spins, you're at over 80%. To try to really drive home the point, here is a little uh, code called double plus one. I start off with capital is how much money I start with. I play the strategy. I play it uh, spins. That's the number of times I play it. And I always bet a dollar and then follow the strategy for subsequent bets. Here is a plot of what happens. In the beginning, things are going very well. If you notice, I have a couple of times when I start to lose some money, but then I recover and I make money again, go down, recover, and then I have my unlucky time. And my unlucky time, eventually, I lose, and I lose so badly, I'm now a negative, and I never get out. I no longer have money to play with. So you know, this is the takeaway slide for the double plus one method. Now, fascinating questions might be, as you change the probability, where does this point change? How is this a function of the initial capital? Lots of great questions you can ask. Uh, yes? Right. Then with all the coefficients be zero because there'd be a zero percent chance of having five blacks in the other time. For for the initial conditions, yes. But that would just change the initial conditions. It would be a little bit more involved recurrence relation. All right, so we will move to the continuous system on Monday and call and you know applications of probability to continuous systems, in particular the Battle of Trafalgar and how mathematics supports what Horatio Nelson did. Let me just try to turn this off.